Hi, I'm Sam Hawley. Welcome back to ABC News Daily. I'm coming to you from Gadigal Land. As we embark on 2023, many of us will be thinking about our finances and whether this year will be any easier than last year. Today, with the possibility of a global recession still very much on the cards, we look at how Australia might fare. I'm Alan Collar, finance guy on the ABC News, a columnist for the New Daily and writer or founder of Eureka Report. Mm -hmm. Many hats. Alan, uh, happy 2023. Thank you. We're going to talk about the economy again, of course. Predicting what will happen with the economy, I gather, can be a little bit difficult. But I want you first to tell me about 2022. At this time last year, you made some predictions about what would happen with the economy. What were they back then? (laughs) <laughs> uh, well, look, the predictions about the future are very difficult. Um, so, uh, you know, I, t- I tend not to make too many predictions, but I did mm. uh, think that the Reserve Bank at the time was getting left behind by inflation. Mm. Inflation was clearly starting to get away from everybody. Uh, this was, you know, January, February last year. Inflation has surged to a 10-year high. Inflation now at the highest level since 1982. Sending already sky-high prices soaring even higher. And economists are expecting an interest rate rise this year. And at that point, the Reserve Bank was still saying that interest rates wouldn't change for three years. So I kind of was saying and writing at the time that um, this was a mistake and that um, they would need to and should be uh, responding to higher inflation then. Um they didn't respond until May. I mean, I said in sort of January, February that the longer they leave it, the harder they'll have to go mm. and the higher they'll have to put up rates um, more quickly. And that's kind of what happened. They started putting up interest rates in May. Mm. target for the first time in over a decade with a 25 basis point hike to 0.35%. If passed on in full by banks... Uh, raised interest rates eight times in a row. Mm and took the cash rate from 0.1% to 3.1%, which is where it stands now. As you mentioned, eight times interest rates went up last year. You thought, in fact, the RBA, what, should have moved sooner to do that and then it wouldn't have had to put them up by so much. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, I mean, I think they should have stopped earlier than 3.1%. You know, the, Mm. the, the market is predicting that the that the cash rate will go to 3.75% sometime this year, perhaps in uh, August or September. You know, I, I think if that happens, there'll be a recession. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I, and I don't think it'll happen, actually. I think there may be one more rate, rate hike and that's it. Mm. Because inflation is already yesterday's story. I mean, uh, we saw the monthly inflation data that the uh, the Bureau of Statistics puts out for December and that came in a bit higher than expected and it was and it took the annual inflation rate back up above 7% it had been down to 6.9 and it's now up to 7.4 mm. in December so the Australian story looks looks a bit different the, the rest of the world is seeing inflation come down now in particular in America the inflation's on the way down and basically markets are believing that inflation has peaked and is coming down. I think that's correct. So I, I do think that the Reserve Bank and global central banks generally have done enough to control inflation and have, uh, and need to now stop. Mm. They don't have to do any more. Sounds like we're now talking about the predictions for 2023. But from what you're saying, it sounds a little rosier than perhaps we saw last year. Oh, look, I, well, in terms of inflation, yes. Mm. But look, uh, stock markets have had the best start to the year for ages. I mean, it's, the global market's up 5% the first two weeks, Australian market up 5.2%, European stock markets are up 7%. I mean, these, these are huge rises in two weeks. And it's because um, the markets are seeing lots of good news, not only, not only inflation coming down, but also China opening up, uh, giving up on zero COVID, and also... Uh, the European winter has turned out to be warmer than expected. So the, the impact of the increase in energy prices caused by the war in Ukraine is uh, not as great as might have been expected. Mm. And so these factors are kind of all combining to make everyone feel a bit better about 2023. 
Mm, okay, so I want to return then to interest rates because you mentioned that you expect there will be another rate rise, even though things are looking a lot rosier. Is that actually necessary for the RBA to do that again? You sort of see it as inflicting misery on the Australian people, on Australian families, don't you? Well, uh, yeah. The way the system works is that uh, there's one tool to control inflation, and that is interest rates. So when inflation declines, uh, interest rates come come down, and when inflation goes up, interest rates go up. And the and the reason that they put interest rates up is to inflict misery on people, either through unemployment or mortgage stress. Now, I mean, as I'm saying, I don't think there's going to be a big increase in unemployment as things stand. There might be in time, but the, but part of the purpose of putting up interest rates is to achieve higher unemployment, mm. and it's certainly uh, aimed at producing mortgage stress. Otherwise, why do it? The, the idea is to to slow spending down uh, by putting up interest rates. And the way that works is that people have to pay more on their mortgage and therefore they spend less elsewhere. And something like 10 to 15% of people actually really suffer. So the question is how many people are affected in that way? How, how many people? The Reserve Bank itself has studied this and put out a graph which shows that uh, something like 14.6% of people will go into a negative cash flow situation mm. if the interest rate goes to 3.6%, which is what the market is predicting now. It's not there yet. Currently, the cash rate is 3.1%, not 3.6%. So 3.1%, what is it? Is it? It's not 14.6%, but it might be 10%. So just as a, at a guess, and I don't know this for sure, but 10% of people are finding themselves, will find themselves now in a negative cash flow situation in their family. Now that's, I'm saying that that's miserable. I mean, the, the, the Reserve Bank is deliberately inflicting that kind of misery on families in order to bring inflation down. Well, really? I mean, how long, how long are we gonna do that for? I think it's ridiculous. I think it's a terrible thing that we're in this situation where the only way we can bring inflation down is by inflicting misery on people. I mean, goodness me. What else, Alan, can they do? What I mean, what else can they do? You're saying this is a, a, a stupid way of in dealing with inflation. We're hurting hundreds of thousands, millions of Australians by doing this. So what, sh what in your view, should change? What do they need to well, do? Well, let's just, before we get onto that, let's just reflect on, on how we got to this situation. It was mm -hmm. uh, a New Zealand economist named William Phillips published a paper in 1958 which linked unemployment with wages. And then subsequent uh, economists, including Milton Friedman, uh, took the further link to inflation. So a series of economists from, you know, the late 50s to about 1980 uh, decreed that the that inflation was caused by unemployment and that the way to get inflation down was by increasing unemployment. Now, in the 1960s, we had full employment, which meant 2% unemployment or less. But after 1980, as a result of um, the work by Milton Friedman and others, full employment was redefined to be something called the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment or the NARU, N-A-I-R-U. And the NARU is the definition now of full employment, but it's defined in terms of inflation. So the unemployment rate that they're aiming at is not full employment as we, you and I would uh, see it, mm. which is, you know, something like 2% or, you know, where everyone's got a job, but it's the level of unemployment that doesn't cause inflation mm. to accelerate. And that is defined as being about 5%. And so that's what the, that's what the aim is. Mm. I mean, that's, that's how they have redefined their aim. And you, and you note that the US economist Lynn Alden compares it to bloodletting in medicine. Oh, she said that, um, she said that the, the idea of central policymakers, central bankers, purposely creating more unemployment as the way to control inflation will be seen in future as the economic equivalent of bloodletting in medicine. Mm. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and you know, 200 years ago or 300 years ago, bloodletting was the way everyone thought it was correct. Mm. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we laugh at it now, but people, <laughs> poor old Lord Byron, he got the flu mm -hmm. and they, you know, they took his blood out and he died. Mm. It happened to people all the time. Anyway, okay, I mean, so 
Ellen, back to the question, which is what is the alternative to using interest rates to control inflation? What else is it that we could actually be doing? Uh, We've had an example of the alternative, which was the federal government putting a cap on the price of gas of $12 per gigajoule. Mm. So they've actually said because they can't do anything, you know, the increasing unemployment doesn't do anything to the price of gas, so they've actually announced a cap on it. Well, there you are. Do that. Mm. <laughs> there's, there's, there's what you can do. They're the government. They can do what they like. So you can, in fact, control prices. I mean, there have been uh, uh, several attempts to I- impose a regime of price control. In 1948, there was a, a um, referendum to put into the constitution the ability of governments to control prices, and that that was defeated. And I think there was another one in 1973 with Whitlam, and that was defeated as well. Because the Australian Parliament is the only parliament in any country of the world, the only national parliament in any country you can think of, which can't pass laws about all factors required to manage the national economy. So nobody wants to give politicians the power to control prices, and I understand that, that's fair enough, because politicians are sometimes uh, incompetent. (laughs) So you (laughs) can't... The point is, Alan, there are ways to bring inflation under control other than inflicting what you call misery on the Australian people, but I gather that's not going to change in the short term. And you did mention there will be, you think, at least another interest rate rise. Tell me what your prediction is after that for 2023. Please tell me there's some rosy outlook there to give everyone some hope for the year ahead. There, I think things are, are relatively rosy. I mean, mm-hmm. um, inflation is going to come down. Interest rates might go up one more time. I don't think it need, they need to, but that seems to be the consensus of the you know, the bulging foreign economists. And uh, if, if that's the case, I think interest rates will just stay there for the rest of the year and start coming down next year. Mm. There's plenty of employment. Uh, immigration has rebounded. Look, I, I, I do think that there are reasons to be optimistic about the economy. Mm. I don't think we'll have a recession. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think things will be fine. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alan Kohler. <laughs> I, I'm sure a safe prediction is always that many predictions will be wrong, but let's hope that your prediction is absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. My pleasure. Alan Kohler is the finance guy on the ABC's 7 o'clock news. The Reserve Bank Board is scheduled to meet for the first time this year on February the 7th. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer this week is Sydney Pete. I'm Sam Hawley. To get in touch with the team, email us on ABC News Daily at abc.net.au. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.